Thank you. Hello. I want you to close your eyes. Thank you. Just keep them closed. Just for a second. opening bars of Kyrie from Palestrina's Musai Papa Marcello. Some of the most beautiful, natural, unfettered harmony that you can imagine. What's happening there? Incredible raw notes coming out. No musical instrument ties those notes down to something. They're coming from souls, from human souls. Different notes coming together, making music. What? It's a big question. What is music? So we have a go at trying to build it up from the very beginning? In the next 18 minutes, we'll go on a journey and see if we can find some very interesting things just hidden within the way, the way we thought music was, the way it is. Things, including a little secret in there that have fascinated me for years. So, starting at the very beginning, we're gonna need some ingredients. We're gonna need some notes to make music. We need notes, we need rhythm. What are those notes? Did you ever stop and ask yourself what this stuff was? What the notes actually are? Why there's eight in an octave? Why there's 12 there? In the next few minutes, we're going to look at exactly why or why not those numbers are there, what they mean. So right at the beginning, we've got a really boring thing here. The geeks will know this is a sine wave. It's a note. It's a pure oscillation. It's just making a tone. It's pretty boring, there's nothing interesting going on there. By itself, it's not much use, but it is a note. It is something we can use as a starting point. It's what Palestrina used as a starting point there, the opening single note. But what did he do next? He did this. Lovely, pure, clear, simple harmony. Another wave, twice the frequency. The men come in on the low D, the women come in on the high D. They fit together, you can see the fit. There's no doubt that that is perfect. There is something incredibly right about the fitting together of those waves. So now we've got two notes. We've got a low one and a high one. They're sort of the same. One's twice as fast as the other. They fit together. They make a harmony. But we're going to need more. We're going to need a lot more to make the rich tapestry of that music and the rest of the music that we love. So let's find ourselves another one. I just want you to listen again to the very beginning of that same piece of Palestrina. Just listen to the way the octave comes in. Thank you. Okay, now, the opening of the Kyrie from his other, another of his great masses, the Missae Christi Eterna Muneri, goes like this, and you'll hear he does something else. Okay. Let's go back and let's just do that again. Listen what he's doing from the beginning. Okay. Right. Now I can talk about this and I can show you how those waves all fit together in other mathematical and interesting ways, but I'm actually going to get you to feel it now because this comes from the soul. So this side here, you're in the bass section and you're going to come in with a key. So for me, please, from here. Key louder, key quiet. Okay, tenors. Okay, you know what the note is because you can feel it inside you. You know it. Key. Okay, let's have you please. Key, key. Right, ready for the opening. We're going to now perform the Palestrina of Missai Christi Attorney Muneri. Okay, so with me here, please. Key, key, together, right, rubbish, <laughs> rubbish, okay, this is, this is Wales, 
Come on. So I want to hear it now. Keep. And you come in with keep. And you're going to listen to how those waves hit each other and feel the resonance, okay? Keep. Keep. Beautiful. And you have now felt what we call a perfect fifth. It's a wave that looks like this. It's a three and a two fitting together. That's the maths behind what you just did. You didn't know it was a three and a two. You knew it fitted together. You knew somewhere inside you that harmony d d does things like that. You can take two notes that sound, do they sound right? They sound almost more than right. They sound like they were made to fit together that way. There's an old word, just, that's sometimes used in music theory for this relationship. It's a just relationship. It's right, it's proper. It's how it should be. And that's the basis of some of that incredible choral music. There are others. There's a, there's a four to three ratio. We sometimes call this a fourth. It's the first two notes of Amazing Grace. La, la. If you, I'm not going to make you do it. You're rubbish. But if you did do it, you'd hear the same thing again. A beautiful, a beautiful consonance. The waves fit together in a regular way. Every four above, there's three below. Beautiful. It keeps on going. So we're on to something here. We've got three notes and an octave note higher, the one at the top end. We've got four notes now out of eight that we'd not, we might need to make basic music. So the ancient Greeks, and in fact going back beyond that to the Babylonians, but the Greeks were most famous for this. Pythagoras got onto this. He loved numbers, and he loved whole numbers, and he loved whole number ratios. So having spotted that you can do a very neat thing, and we give them some labels, C through C, it's just a convenient thing, it's the way music tends to structure itself. You've got your G up there, that's your three over two, that's your key, key. Uh, you've got your four over three, that's your ah, may. And if you do some trickery with other whole number ratios in there, these are called the Pythagorean ratios by some people, you've got a scale. That will give you the white notes on a piano. Do a little bit more mucking around with them, and you can get some other ratios that give you five black notes that sit in between those, okay? So it looks something like this. It's a piano. Have you not stopped to think why those numbers are like that? We're going to explore this a bit more in a minute. Why eight? Well, it's actually seven, isn't it? Because the eighth is just the same as the first one again. Seven, it's a pretty, it's a pretty rough number. It's a prime number. Why, why would that be the basis of music? And then five, and, and why that spacing like that? But let's, let's just park that and for a little minute and assume we've now got 12 things, 12 pretty evenly spaced. In fact, yeah, 12 evenly spaced things. We call them semitones. They are the basic building blocks of Western music. Okay, 12. Now, I like 12. 12 I like a lot more than seven. 12's nice. 12's fours and threes and sixes and twos and you do clever things with it. And so, mm, perhaps we're onto something. I know what, let's stick them all in a row on a keyboard. We'll put one block of 12, another block of 12, another block of 12. Seven and a half blocks of 12, seven and a bit blocks of 12, you have a standard grand piano keyboard, 88 keys, blacks and whites. And with this, you have the full tapestry of, of wonderful music. You basically, you've taken that perfection, you know, the raw perfection that you were feeling yourselves when you sang the, har the fundamental note and then the harmonic consonant um, harmonies above it. You've taken that and you put it on a keyboard, right? Not quite. And this is the bit I find really fascinating because I never got taught this at school. I'm not a musician. I'm interested in the science of it. You take this keyboard, and I don't know if it's working, I'm not going to play it, but um, it's got those octaves all laid out, big long row notes, and I'm just going to see, maybe it is actually. And the great thing about it, oh, fantastic. Um, the, <laughs> the great thing about this layout with all this even spacing is that. Uh, I've got, here's my, oh, let's see. Okay, so there's my perfect fifth. Oh, and I've got another one here. Oh, good. So if I take one note and then pick another seven steps up, we call it fifth, it's seven steps, it's all because of the black-white thing. Don't stress it. Um, you can always find your fifth. So this is great. So on this keyboard, I've got any combination then of scales and chords and different ways of arranging music. I can play in lots of different keys. It's wonderful. How is this? Uh, we just we started with those raw notes, we wrote them down, we gave them names, we put them in a big long line, called it a keyboard, and it allowed us this incredible flexibility. Right? Not quite. This is the interesting bit. Because and I couldn't I really loved it when I first found out how this worked. If you start down here, that's a really low C, and you go all the way up to
a C right at the top there, I don't know if you hear that. Um, you've done seven octaves, okay? You've gone through seven times 12, 84. You've gone through 84 keys, and you've got back to a note you call the same note. With me so far? Please? Okay. Yeah. Oh, is Mark Hesseltine here? Mark's playing a game where anyone that says iPhone, he drinks, um, and when he, anyone says iPad, he finishes his glass. So I'd just like to say to Mark and Riney and a few others playing the game, iPhone, 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 iPad, can you get them a taxi? <laughs> okay, so back to this. I play, I've gone right away from here. I, all the C's. I've got to the top. I've done 84 notes. I've got back where I started. But if I did that by going in fifths, bear with me, I'm not going to go right the way through it. And kept on going, I would get back to my C where I started. I've just gone, instead of going, um, remember a fifth is seven steps, instead of doing 12, uh, seven lots of 12, I've done 12 lots of seven. Okay, with me? 12 sevens equals seven twelves. This is the really weird bit, and it blew my brain when I realized this. So look at the, what you've done in mathematical terms when you've gone through seven octaves. You've gone two, doubled seven times, two to the times two, times two, times two, times two, it's two to the power seven. You've gone up 128 times in frequency. So if you started with something wobbling at 10 hertz, then it's, I guess, uh, 1280 hertz by the time you got there. You've multiplied your frequency up 128 times. Okay, that's just ordinary doubling. But you'd think, from what I just said about the way we built those notes up and we based them on all those lovely raw harmonic principles, that if I do this, which is three over two, that's the, remember that's the, the, the seven note thing, it's the ratio of three waves to two waves, you felt it yourselves, it feels natural, it's the C to the G to the D. If you do that to the power 12, you're gonna get to the same answer, aren't you? You're gonna get to 128. Ah, keen mathematicians in here will recognize something called the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, which says you can only get one set of prime, multi of prime factors of any number. There's only one. So I can tell you already just from that theorem that that does not equal 2 to the power 7. It, but it equals something really kind of weird. 129.7463. Where am I going with this? You're wondering, aren't you? <laughs> it's not quite the same as 128, but it's bloody close. It's 1.36% out. It's a tiny, tiny bit of wrongness on that keyboard. Mathematically, definitely existing, proven wrongness. It's out. It's a fudge. Every piano you've ever seen, pretty much, unless you've seen some old ones pre-1750, but that's another lecture, <laughs> is a fudge. It's a fake. Well, the thing that you've been told is the perfect... It can't be. It's got to be slightly different. Somewhere we're not fitting with the nice harmonic ratios. This blew my mind away. Pythagoras found it too. It's called... Does anyone know what it's called? Oh, good. <laughs> this is your takeaway phrase from my TED Talk. This is the Pythagorean comma. <laughs> comma. Comma as in a gap, as in, a, uh, in the sense of breaking something up, a pause, a space... So this is Pythagoras' comma. It was the thing they didn't know what to do with. It was the misfit between all those beautiful harmonic things where, where we sing naturally without frets, without string, uh, pre-tuned strings. It's the, thing that made us, it, it, it's, it's, it's the thing that made that incompatible with knocking out a nice, easy 88-key piano. You could do a million different scales and chords on, modulating from key to key to key. This is a really odd thing, don't you think? So every time you looked at a piano and thought you were seeing a G, it's not quite. It's good enough. The, the, the human ear will probably won't pick it up. But just knowing it was a bit of a fudge that almost all the music I listened to in Western civilization was a bit of a fudge, that was a bit of a blow to me. A bell. A bell's a nightmare. You bang a bell, you get a fundamental note, brrr, comes from it. But because of the way it's cast, because of the way the metal's formed, you get all sorts of harmonies and resonances flowing over the top of this. They all clash together and bang, and their frequencies add. You have no chance of getting a pure note. The phrase, as clear as a bell, is a bloody great irony, as far as I'm concerned, in terms of harmonic theory. This is another way around the problem. Hey, let's just make a keyboard. This is a keyboard with 211, 211 notes in an octave. 12, 211. Some crazy, mic there are some really crazy, if you fancy a search on microtonal, there's some very interesting people out there. So somebody built one of these things. I don't know how you play it. 
Um, they built this. This is another one. Look at this. It's got sharps, double sharps, triple sharps, little tiny fractions of those notes. People trying to find a fit between all that lovely um, offline, uh, all that lovely natural harmony and something you could actually structure. I'm just going to play you a tiny piece of something which just forgets 12, the, 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 the 12 semitone scale. Listen to this. Oh, enough, 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 enough. It's brilliant, but it's not like we know music. It's 31 notes in a scale there. That's the th it's known as the, what, the 31 note mean tone scale. Incredible. People build instruments to do that. So, why is this interesting? Well, for me, something as raw and pure as natural harmonies, harmonies that live inside us when you hear people singing in the street, in a village in Africa, when you hear the way their voices work together, that's a natural, beautiful thing. When you try and map that down and build machines to do it, you have to make a lot of compromises. Actually, lots of instruments don't suffer from this. Violins, you can choose by feel and touch where you stop the string. It's the ones with the frets, the ones with the keys like this, that you had to make a decision. As soon as you cast that Note, you've made a compromise. You've fudged it a bit. You've had to do that a bit. And I just find that beautiful. I find that a parallel with creative thinking, when sometimes if you really try and pin down every detail, you may lose the overall picture, the overall message. So, various ways into this. Um, the simple solution that we seem to have converged on in Western civilization is just to even it all out. That allows us the wonderful modulated works. I'm going to finish with a little piece in a second. Um, you wouldn't be able to do this. Okay. And that's Bach reinventing the, this series of equal, equal temperance to be able to do things like that, to show off in all those different keys and make it all work. So, within order and beauty, there is structure. As soon as you put the structure in, you have to compromise on some of the purity of the beauty. And all of that sat on black and white notes on the keyboard. And you probably didn't realise that. Maybe. I certainly didn't. So, be just. Be harmonious but be prepared to be a bit flexible too.